Okay. So um, I want to welcome everyone to this, this meeting of the Houston Functional User Programming Group. Um, today uh, we have our own uh, speaking. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself, but um, he is our uh, relatively new liaison to uh, improving and organizing for all the technology and making sure everything actually runs. Um, and so we are very, very grateful to them and uh, appreciate it. And so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, cool. Um, so let me back to talk or say something about myself. Introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Ahmed. I am an approver here. Um, and um, yeah, I am. Um, Sadly, I don't uh, professionally. I don't do code and functional language. I'm C sharp, JavaScript, React. I do dabble in functional language here, but usually some very of scheme. I'll wrap it into the favorite. So I'm more of a dabbler, but I do like it. Have for a long time kind of kept my eye on a bunch of programming and kind of sort of back around. So I do find this very well. Very interesting. So um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's um, that is. okay. So um, yeah, so this talk today is about uh, property-based testing um, in F sharp using FS check, and in reality, it's it's really it's really even though I'm using F sharp and FS check, it's going to be about property-based testing in general. So what I'm talking to you about is really more of the mindset of property-based testing, and uh, you know, and just you know. Kind of what it is, how it fits into your testing strategy, the mindset to bring to it, because you can really adopt it even in an ad hoc way without a framework. Right? So, but again, I'm going through the lens of Sharp and FS Chat because those are some uh, nice tools for product based testing. Um, and so, um, and in particular, we're going to talk about like how the mindset. Of the sure, of course. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions or anything, please let me know. So then our show just feel free to speak up. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so we'll talk about like the concept of mindset behind PBTs, practice tests, and invariants, which are central to, to really uh, what problem based testing is all about. And, um, and I'll walk you through um, an actual like kind of toy example to show you all the features and then a high level case study where I actually use this um, in the field in a prior. And the caveat again, I'm not an F sharp or FS check expert. I dabble in the various uh, languages and tools um, and use that product based tester in an ad hoc way as needed for the time okay. So, okay. So, so before starting, um, is everyone here uh, like written automated tests? Are you familiar with the general idea behind automated testing? Do you need a bit of a sort of uh, kind of uh, Pressure on this, or pretty comfortable with like uh, just at least part of the testing. I'll take that as you decide on it. What's best? Okay, <laughs> okay. See a thumbs up. Okay, cool. So, okay. So, um, so right now, so so right now, um, again, to run FS check, of course, we install it, right? And so I just install it through a new get package. Okay. Now, FS check can be used directly, and that's how I'm going to use it here. Because I'm running everything here through a polyglot notebook, which is super cool. It's basically like a Jupyter notebook that I can run with F sharp. Uh, so I'm going to run this directly. But FS check also does have support for N unit and X unit at the very least. So if you're using those frameworks, you also have additional libraries that fit in very nicely with, uh, with those. Okay? So I'm going to be running it directly just for the way I kind of chose to do this stuff. So we have FS check, we have it installed. And now we want to we want to talk about the code to test. So I want to go through like I give you like a toy example to test with something that can get let, get us to focus on the test, but still has enough interesting edge cases to kind of you know give us something to hopefully surprise us, right? So I'm going to write basically a division function, which essentially is the same thing you already have. I already have math with rem. I'm going to write my own intentionally. Um, not so good version, and kind of use it as a way to kind of show the different, different sort of capabilities and features of FS check. And we start to run some fake testing as well, 
and then we move on to something a little bit. Okay. So if I divide, so I said, okay, I want a division function. I'm going to pretend that that div run and it's uh, going to exist. And I'm just going to say, yeah, okay, fine. I'm going to take, you know, divide x and y, right? divide quotient, you know, divide it up, number, you know, uh, divide dividends. Let me get back a portion of the remainder of time. Okay. So I define this function. Let's say this is my function. And this is going to be my function. So I'm like, okay, I wrote this function. I want to start testing. Okay. Now, so normally, the way we normally do our write tests is what, what we call what are called example-based tests. Um, for a lot of people, they're just called tests because this is kind of like a default, right? Um, and essentially, and essentially what happens is you know, you, you essentially go ahead and call what you're testing. Like in this case, divide, you call it on a specific data point, right? And you compare it to what the results should be. So essentially, you tested an example. This is an example of the input. I know this input should produce this output. Here we go. And at the heart of it is essentially some kind of you know assertion expect kind of like what you're working with. Okay. So here I run my test, I run an assertion, and I'm like, yeah, if I divide two by two, I should get a question one or maybe one. Yay, okay, cool, we do, right? Check it. Ship it, right? Yeah. We're done. We have our one test, we're good to go, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and we ship after this, we're gonna do machine. Yeah. And of course we ship after this, we got bigger problems and not using property-based testing, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but essentially with enough of these tests, right? The idea is that if we have enough of these types of example-based tests, that we get more confidence that the code that we have is working the way it should. Okay. Now, and again, this is kind of like the default. Whenever you talk to people about about any kind of unit test or automated tests, a lot of times you know, it's example based tests. Right? They don't really think of any other kind of test, right? And and it's I mean, and, and it has some advantages, right? I mean, we we can find that it, it, it's correct at least for very specific data points. We can actually test a function based on what we know should go in and out without any kind of like and a little bit overview or insight into how the function works. But the disadvantages are we have to provide all of our data points. Or we have to provide enough of a representative set of data points that we feel we've covered the testing space enough to flush out the bugs. And it becomes easy to miss like edge cases or particular code class, or even to like let our own bias creep into the test, right? Even if we're not trying to be biased, right? So, so can I interrupt with a very quick story? Uh, back in the 90s. Uh, I appreciate my stories from back in the 90s when I had been hired and a researcher, and I ended up, I was tasked with writing tests. Right? And I was writing various tests, and the uh, sysadmin uh, yelled at me because I was writing all these tests for things that couldn't possibly happen. And I need to stop writing those tests. The impossible happens more often than you think. I don't remember anymore. I just remember <laughs> thinking I don't respect you. Like, <laughs> but but I mean that's but that's but that's that's a really good point because there is that danger in that you think okay well. This is, this is always the way it should be used. I'm not going to test it. Maybe it doesn't even creep into something that we could or should test. It's just so much like background that we don't even think about, it, right? And that's one of the things with the level based test that, you know, you sometimes can even like you skip over these test cases, not realizing they're test cases. So, so, so what, what, are, what are alternatives? Now, why I say I use the term alternative, but in reality, property based test and example based test no side by side. Use them together, one feeds into the other. It's not an either or situation. You use the one that's, that's appropriate. But so what so what is like an, an additional tool, tool let's say? And and property-based tests as well. So let's look at an example of a property-based test, right? And here's where you get to see some Korean. We're talking a little bit about Korean. Uh, so as we do a little bit more of the so I'm going to talk a little bit about Korean So with property-based tests, what you do is you're testing for properties that have to universally hold regardless of it. Another way of looking at it is this. You can write a test, but you don't get to choose what the data is. And yet you test test the So, and so you're looking for things that are called invariants. 
things that have to hold no matter what you think it is about genetics. So in this case, so we start thinking, okay, huh, division, division. What's an invariant in division? What's something that universally holds no matter what the division? One of them is the identity property of division, right? Anything divided by one is equal to itself, right? X over one equals X. Okay, so what I do is I write this property, right? And this basically says, hey, this is a this is a name of a property. And of course, it has two arguments. One of them is the function to actually call, and the other is the, the input x. Now, in this case, I'm not actually hard coding the actual function because I want to pass in some different functions. I want to pass in divide, but also want to pass in some mock functions I'm going to take care of. So I'm going to say, hey, yeah, then any problem, I'm going to pass in a function. I'm also going to pass in you know, or, you know, some argument, or rather the system's going to get some argument. And I'm going to say, hey, this function, when applied to this argument and applied to one, has to give me a tuple of that same argument and zero. Anything divided by one gives me, oh, gives me that thing, the main procedure. Okay? So that's my identity problem. And that, at the heart of it, is this thing here, check quick. And what this does is it'll tell a property-based tested framework, hey, Go ahead and run this over a set of random values and confirm that every single one of them passes. Okay. So in this case, I say, hey, take this identity property and pass it the division argument. In this case, I'm just passing it one argument. I'm not passing it x. Because it's queried, it takes that argument and it has a function basically that expects one more argument that's unspecified. And the property based tested framework FS check will provide values for the other argument. And it knows which one it needs to provide because it knows the type of this part of it. Okay? That shows us a pretty nice uh, type of So I'm going to run this. Okay? And, yeah. and you can see right here, it passed with 100 tests. Okay? Now, and again, it, it takes a moment to run, but that could be just because of the notebook. So it could actually run faster when you run it like more natively. So over here, so here basically it ran 100 times with random values for X. And it confirmed that for all of those runs, every single one of them passed. Okay. Can we see which values it put in? Uh, yes. In fact, later on, I'm going to show you how we can actually see all the values that are generated, control the end and so on. Yes. Yeah. Short answer for both. Uh, check for both. Long answer. You're going to see in a moment. Uh, how to do it. Yep. Cool. Other questions? Yes. Ah, I think I don't need to talk about that for zero. Max, so you're anticipating it, but yes, there are the um, FS check does support filters. And I'm going to show you how to use those in a little bit because we're going to run into those filters and especially around the zero points. You're, yeah, so you're kind of, you're kind of uh, anticipating where I'm going with something. Yes, and you're going to see how to do that in a, in a little bit. You absolutely can. Yes, and I'll show you how. Good question. Yes. I recall finding filters taking random integers. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So if we ran this test enough times, you'll get the so, so in this particular case, so this this is a really good question. In fact, it's something that that bears a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of attention to. So, it does pick random values, but I've noticed that it'll actually pick random values that are constrained within a narrow range. So it's not actually picking, it's not actually generating, say, values from, say, mid in to max in, in, in between. It's actually picking a much narrower range. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive, some of them are around zero. And I think it's doing that intentionally because it's trying to pick basically values that are likely to cause issues. So in fact, when you look at the verbose that we want to keep passing in verbose, you're going to notice that it's generating a very, very narrow range of verbose, right? So you can, given an n size, so it generates a much broader range of numbers. But if you do that, it's going to be much less likely. It's going to start hitting, say, negatives and zeros because it's got a lot more numbers. So the answer it is random, but 
but its constraints were really narrow, but it's much narrower than this. It's probability. So two words, bias, same thing. Um, so it's it's yeah, so it's it's basically so it's not generating, it's not generating, say, like the whole range of numbers. It actually has a narrow window of integers and it generates random numbers. So it's actually it actually generates among the very yeah, no, that, that was my reaction to my first reaction was like what the hell? Um later, later on I was like, okay, I kind of see why. Uh, just because when you have a really, really broad range of numbers. Your chances of say hitting certain points like say zero or near are much much lower. So I think it tries to stay in that window because if you're going to run into any. That might be my thing. I wasn't sure. Um. So yeah. Sorry about that. I I thought I read like your original quick check was in Haskell. Yes. 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 As a that, that it just by default it sort of analyzed. The input range and sort of heuristically pick boundaries that it thought would be interesting. Like it automatically picked zero that's, uh, that's just to check. Yeah. And maybe it would pick max integer just to check, that kind of thing. So, so this doesn't is, do yeah. this in F sharp? Yeah, so FS check definitely, um, FS check definitely is inspired from Quick Check. Quick Check is kind of like the granddaddy, right? Um, and it may very well be choosing these because it decides they're interesting. But in running them, in running like the values, unless I actually change the nth size, which is like a parameter, it says what's the highest endpoint you should generate. I've noticed that it never goes beyond a very narrow range of numbers. So there is a default max. There is there is a default max that you can configure, and when you configure, you kind of see why it's it's it stays in that narrow area. And when we run the verbose examples, you'll see the kinds of values it's generating. You notice that they're very biased towards a very small window of numbers. Yes. And it did, and it was something that did kind of like irk me for a bit. And, so, and yeah. by default, how many is it do? 100? By default, it's 100. And you can change that also. Yes. Yeah. And rather just like five and the yeah. range yeah. <laughs> yeah. of the range <laughs> yeah. than 100 in a, in a band. Yeah, I think I think the general idea is that you want to have enough there, enough like enough samples there that you're likely to hit some unexpected behaviors if they're there but of course you don't want so much that it's going to bog down your test so i mean so i guess they chose 100 but yeah i mean the fact that you can change like the number of the tests i think it's like a max test parameter to the configuration object and you can control that yeah but idea is i like kind of finding that balance where you're going to get enough of that sample that's tested to at least figure out if you do run into any issues so good questions cool any questions from anyone out there in uh no, I want you to go on, okay, and, okay, then we'll, okay. and then we'll okay. ask you. Okay, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Okay, Ahmed <laughs> um, doesn't mind interruptions. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I spoke about myself in third person. So, um, yeah. So again, so we leave at least one argument to be randomly generated, right? And we can have multiple arguments that are randomly generated, and it will provide them. It'll provide them all according to the type. So, at the very least, it respects the type. Um, and yeah, it gives us test coverage, more test coverage, right? We got hundred tests. It, get, it avoids test bias, it's going to pretty much be picking these different numbers that we might necessarily even think about picking. But you know, the cost here is that we end up with less depth, less test depth, right? In a, an example-based test, we actually confirm that this division was correct for that example. In this case, this is a very shallow property, right? We got 100 tests, but there's a lot of failing functions that can pass this particular test. And there are more sophisticated invariants that can give us more depth but we can't always be so lucky as to find these kinds of invariants, right? So we kind of trade depth for breadth. And we, of course, we always have to think of an invariant, right? What is it that can universally hold in the code that I'm testing? And sometimes, you know, that may be a bit of a non-trivial task. So to so give you an idea of like the shallowness of this, right? This particular property, here's a fake division example, right? It takes, it takes two arguments, and it always just returns the first argument zero, right? And of course, when we run that, and that's why I also like parameterize my identity property, just like it pass in different division functions. And of course, if I run this, we're gonna see that, you know, lo and behold, it passed. Woohoo, even this is an obviously fake example. Again, it's a shallow property, right? So 
we get test breadth, but we want to also like start to figure out how we're going to get depth, right? Do we add more properties? Do we make our um, invariants more sophisticated? And so that's what we're going to start digging into in a little bit more detail. So, so the first key with property-based testing is that we need to start thinking about invariants, right? We want to look at our code and start asking, what are the universal properties that will hold my code? And maybe it's even a property that holds in a particular window, right? Maybe there's a constraint there, but it's something that at least is going to hold for a sufficiently large subset of the input, right? And so if we can't, and so, you, you know, you want to really use your insights about your code, but if you're not too sure, you've got some stock invariants here, okay? And there's, and there's more out there, but these are some common invariants, right? Identity, which is what we just tested, right? That they're, that given your function, right, there's going to be some, some value Y that's always going to basically give you back your argument. And again, if you have multiple arguments, different types, you kind of squint a little bit and massage them. You know, a constant element, right? That again, you've got some, you've got some other value for your X or your Y that basically causes it to where your function is going to return a fixed point, right? Just the same, the same constant all the time. Of course, we know about commutativity, right? Hey, can I switch my arguments and still get the same results, right? I'd impotence. Hey, if I apply my function and then I successfully apply the function to the results, do I get the same results, right? Or do successive applications of the function beyond the first one have an impact, right? We got an inverse. Hey, does there exist some function G that'll give me back? You know, that'll give me back my input given the output, right? Is actually, is this function reversible and I, do I know what reverses it? And even have this idea of an oracle, right? It's like, hey, is there another function that does the same thing that this function does, even if it's over, say, a smaller subset of it? And a case of an oracle could be if you're writing a function that's supposed to be a more efficient version of a known function, you might say, okay, well, I can at least use the known function to test and make sure that my more efficient version is correct, right? Is there a reason associated bidding isn't listed? Mm -hmm. Associated um, um, there, so there is a very good reason associativity isn't listed because I forgot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's definitely and there's and there's definitely a, there's definitely yeah this is not a full list of variants. There's definitely going to be more, right? So you can have associativity, and there could be like another dozen that I didn't even think yeah, about. Yeah. 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 Uh, I hadn't heard of Oracle before. Your description is perfect. Um, why is it called Oracle? So, okay, so the short answer, okay, so I'll give you the short answer and I'll give you the good answer. The short true answer is the website where I got this from called it an Oracle, okay? There's actually a website and actually link it that has a list of good properties to use and goes into more depth on these properties. And I've got a further reading section I can paste the URLs. The, um, the, longer, the longer answer is that the term Oracle is used in some like circles, like economic circles, as sort of a function that can give you a result or that can give you some kind of prediction about somewhere. And so the idea is that this function that you're testing against serves as this oracle in a more like economic sense. Yeah. yeah. You, read, you sometimes read about it in some like economics books you talk about these like oracles. So, so um, I think I'm going to be a little bit of a butt here, but how is Oracle, how is that a property and not just a different version of standard unit testing? Well, so the Oracle, so it will be a property because you're not giving it specific data points. You're going to say, hey, for all X over your 100 data points, this Oracle evaluated has to be equal to this, right? Remember with the example based test, the unit test, you're giving it specific data points. Okay, I, I think that's my point is so. This is coming from a real example we, that we can talk about offline and over alcohol. Um, <laughs> but, but basically, I've got equations. I've got I've got software that produces a particular output. I've written new software, and then I'm just going to compare them and see if they give the same results. They give the same results. A dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times, and therefore I conclude that my new software produces the same results as the existing software. Correct. But you're not proving it, I guess is my point. Oh yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah, that is proven. Yeah, that is proven. Yeah, exhaustively. Yeah. 
right to sample the input frame right because everything is just running it over a set of your input so because even your properties right. any one of these properties it's not going to be proved because it's like okay i ran 100 times and you know yes by many developer standards 100 times it might as well be approved but any mathematician would just laugh us out of the room right because it's definitely not approved right and none of these running 100 samples is never going to be approved absolutely yeah because that's the thing or a million or a million yeah i mean unless you exhaustively run through every 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 single one or you actually have a, a mathematical you know proof. your yeah. proof language yeah. that's your yes prove your program script right and you've got some nice and you got stuff like f star which is kind of neat and a few other nice but that's a whole other thing where it actually do like more of that symbolic analysis that you can actually get this hey this was actually proven based on that but yeah but none of this is actually I, I i i okay no, and i understand all of that i think what's interesting for me is until now i wouldn't have thought that getting the same results from different software packages could be considered a property. Mm. Whereas identity is clearly a property, communicativity, right. associativity. I hadn't thought about like this Oracle property. I don't right. know the name, but maybe for that reason. But I hadn't thought about that as a property. And that's that's where I, I got a little stuck. Right. And so yeah, so what I'll definitely say is, yeah, even though we're 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 calling them properties. We definitely want to think about it as they definitely bear a resemblance to mathematical properties, but we don't want to like read too much into it where we want them to be exactly the same. Because even like 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 you both pointed out, we're not even proven any of these properties. We're just like, hey, ran it a hundred times, looks like it holds, let's move on. And yeah, and I might, I might, I might even put like quotes in front of properties, but absolutely. But, but, but that, that makes uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm delaying that. that that makes sense to me of like there are multiple ways of calculating the mean. Mm -hmm. So you so if you're like yeah this calculates the mean and I'm going to test it against this then I have more confidence that the way I'm calculating the mean works right yeah. and that's exactly what it is it's to give you more confidence in, in these things yeah okay yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Oracle example you had that sounds like what you do when you're refactoring but you're refactoring some huge piece of code that you don't yeah. have a lot of tests on or something exactly and you yeah. change this thing you think you cover all the Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. Or even for an entire rewrite of a system, a lot of times they give you the old system. You can write as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that your new system, completely new code, matches every output of the old system. Yeah, yeah. You have a function f one. You refactor it maybe into function f two. You run this on it. Maybe you set your end size to say ten thousand and have a really nice deep run, and then basically be like, hey, okay, looks like my refactoring was a success, or at least. You know, definitely uh, seems it gives me confidence. When I refactor that. now, I'm using a, a static language that is like, yes, it still compiles. So, yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually test whether it works. Yeah. What is such a You will eventually. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone else will. Yeah. If, yeah, if, you get, if you get nothing else from this talk, just set our sites a little bit higher. So a little bit of high impact, <laughs> but yeah, go, but that's go I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This, Look, was, this was helpful. These are all good. I definitely want you to bring these up because, again, this is the kind of stuff that we want to talk about. And I'd rather just be a dialogue. So, this is good. No, you're absolutely right. And yes, for refactoring, this is a classic example the Oracle refactoring. Beautiful example. And then again, you sometimes have solutions that are hard to find but are easy to test, right? We know, like, some of these like NP, you know, hard problems. It's like, hey, okay, well, I know that at least. You know, this has to hold for a solution. I can test it out. Let's see what happens, right? And that's an inherent tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, and there are and there are definitely more of these. Like you pointed out, associativity is not on the list, right? But these can get you can get you started. And again, a lot of times you may actually figure out your own ad hoc property from your own understanding of the code. Definitely go by that. But these are things to lean on if you're not sure. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now let's talk about commutativity. So. Right, so we know in commutativity is an invariant that holds in some in some operations, right? Um, some functions, right? And like for example, addition, right? It's commutative, right? Now, division, of course, is not commutative, right? I mean, generally speaking, x divided by y is not equal to y divided by x. And another example, just to take it away from the realm of mathematics, because this is just about numbers and math, right? You can do this on anything. Appending lists is not commutative, right? Appendant, x appended to y is not the same as y appended to x in general. So we'll say, okay, well, you know what? We don't commutativity doesn't hold. 
let's have an invariant that can, you know, that is not to be commuted. Okay. So we have write another property here called not commutative. And again, I'm going to go ahead and just pass in a function, just like I test my fake divisions and my real divisions. And again, my arguments, X and Y, right? And I'm just saying, hey, you know, F applied to X, Y, it should not be equal to F applied to Y and X, right? And then I'm gonna go ahead and run it first on my fake division, right? And, and here, so here we go now and we see what failure looks like. Behold, the face of failure, right? So in this case, you can see here that it says, um, yeah, this doesn't work and here's why. And it gives me, and it gives me a little bit of an error report along with the data where it fails. We're gonna break down what this, what this means, like what is stand gen, what is a shrink, all that stuff. We're gonna get into that, right? Um, but right now we get a sense of at least what a failure, a failure is. But we also get another important point that if you have a very shallow property, you can add another shallow property, test them in sequence, and there's a good chance that you know they're gonna start fleshing out issues. So even a shallow property doesn't may not get you that far, but two shallow properties can get you a surprising amount of depth and flush out issues. Fake division passed our identity, but the moment I threw commutativity at it, it failed. Although in this case, you can see here from where it failed, we kind of suspect it will fail elsewhere, right? And again, you run a few times and you know. You see it's generating, you know, different sets of values, right? But you also see like some of the narrow ranges of the values it's set. That was after 92 tests yeah. and almost yeah. passed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it took 92 to get to this point, exactly. And then if I run this- That's a little scary. Then it's, yeah. yeah. That's why you add more of the shallow properties and one of them is gonna have a very good chance of flushing, flushing something out. So when I run this, when I run this on the actual division, right? Instead of the fake division, I'm like, hey, okay, we're running fake division. Here it's like, hey, it, it, it finds, it, it, it feels faster. <laughs> it says, hey, this is falsified after two tests and one shrink. My original value is zero, 03, where it failed, okay? And then it shrunk it to zero, 00. And when it shrunk it to zero, 00, it gave me an exception. So shrinking is an attempt by the property-based testing framework. And most property-based tests and frameworks try to do this. Where it finds a failing test case, it tries to walk back to the earliest point where the test failure occurred. But sometimes it'll actually flush out or flush out another test failure. In this case, it found this as, as failing. And this one did actually fail because of division by zero. And it shrunk it to zero, zero, right? And now we see here that it tells me, yeah, I got a division by zero error. And intuitively, you can see why we're getting this, right? We're trying to test commutativity. We're generating random data. Well, my denominator might be zero in the random data that's being generated. And this brings us towards what you were saying, uh, Brian. We're going to see how to address that, right? So in this case, I'm like, okay, I got division by zero. That's not so, cool. So just a minute, on that test, it was trying to do zero divided by three, and then it checked if three could be divided by zero. Is that correct? Yes, okay. exactly. So zero divided by three, zero. Three divided by zero, Okay, uh, divide by zero, not good, right? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes your shrinks will go in such a way where you'll have one error and it'll shrink it and it'll hit an exception. So your shrink actually reveals a different error from your original, right? As that also happens sometimes with the way the shrinking goes on. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is exactly what happened, right? So by reversing them, we realize that we can't just naively reverse them. We got to deal, uh, deal with this. So so over here, so over here, first thing you may, well, not necessarily the first thing you may notice, but you see here that when it gives you the failure, it gives you a standard gen and it gives you these two rather intimidating looking numbers. These numbers are random number seeds that you can use to reproduce that exact one. So if you decide, hey, I wanna reproduce this run after I fix it, you can use this and feed it into the configuration. And I'll show you how it opens, okay? And of course, the original tells you at what point the data fail. This is X and this is Y. Shrink narrows it down to zero, zero. And of course, we see here the exception of division by zero. Right? So, so as it was shrinking, it was exception every time. It just kept up the shrinking until it got this, the smallest in, number. In this particular case, yes. There may be some cases where you are actually finding a different test failure and it may shrink to the point where it hits a division by zero and you get a unique one. But in this case, yes, it was division by zero error each time and it shrunk to zero, zero. Absolutely. But it was only, I thought it said it was only two tests. So it was, 
two, two random tests. Two random tests. So right. one succeeded. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 okay. Right. Okay. Because this is going to hold in a lot of cases. Okay. It's okay. just that, yeah. Okay. Okay. And this also should give you a little bit of insight also into where the narrow range of numbers works because we had a really wide range of numbers. The chances of us hitting zero or even two numbers that are the yeah. same yeah. could be low, right? Yeah. Yeah. So after kind of writing run this a few times, I kind of started seeing like, okay, I kind of see why they want to keep the range narrow. But yeah. Okay. So again, so we see what Trinket does, right? And the idea behind Trinket is it's it's trying to it tries to help you get insight into what caused the error by finding an earliest point at which it happens. Okay. So so with the stand gen, those those are random numbers we saw. Okay, we can use it to reproduce a particular run, and we have a function called check one where we can actually feed in some configurations to sort of cust to customize our test, right? Or if we wanted to, we could just capture that particular failing case as an example based test. Remember, your property based test and your example based test are not in competition. One can feed into the other. If you realize, hey, this just revealed a case that. Is an edge case I didn't realize. You can just say, well, guess what? You're not going to join my, my standard unit test because we need you. This is an edge case, right? And you can definitely do this as a discoverability for, for example-based tests, okay? So, so let's get into like a, how we actually um, do some of the features we're talking about. So here's check one, right? So over here, basically, we call check one. We have our configuration object, and then we're able to customize it here. And in this case, we can customize it by setting the particular one we want to reproduce. So let's go over here, and over here we see this is the particular um, run, right? So if I wanted to ensure, because every time you run this, right, it's going to give you different runs, right? In this case, in this case, you can see here one minus one failed. It was not a division by zero. Shrink and walks it back until it hits a different error. Okay, and we'll, I'm going to revisit this also. So sometimes shrink and reveals a different error. So if I go over here and I'm like, hey, I want to reproduce. This exact test run I had. Why did one minus one fail? So why did one minus one fail? So so commutativity tells us division is not commutative, right? X divided by Y should not be equal to Y divided by X. One divided by negative one is negative one. Negative one divided by one is negative one. So no, so in this case, they happen to both be equal. If if X is if X is the negative version of Y, it's gonna be it's gonna be commutative in that case. Right, but it's said to fail, isn't it? Right, right, because yeah, because oh yeah, because this check is for non commutativity It says, oh that's yeah, okay, sure. yeah. Oh no, 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 that's fine. No, that's fine. Yeah, we're, we're actually testing that in very yeah. not good. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. You're, no, you're good. No, you're good. It's it's most of the time we think in terms of invariance holding. So this is kind of a little bit uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So in this case, so here we so here we say, hey, let's go ahead and set our standard right. Okay, and we're gonna say, hey, I wanna run this, right? And, and in this case, of course, we see now that this reproduced the exact run we had before. So if we wanted to, we could just save whatever the stand gen gives us, and now we can always reproduce our test runs. So we need to fix anything in our code. We can get that, you know, test runs that are of interest and rerun them. Can I, can yeah. I ask a, question, a quick question? I, I'm, I'm interested in this. So is it, is there the ability to either run the test until you get a failure instead of, I'm sorry, run the test until some, so if you're looking for non-commutative, you might not want to say it's, you might not want to prove that it's, it's non-commutative for every pair of numbers, but you might want to say for some pair of numbers, it's non-commutative. Is there sort of some way of, of putting this on its head instead of like looking for Making sure everything passes, looking for the case where at, at least one of them fails. So, um, so what we do? So, so okay. So, or is that even a use case? So, okay. So you're asking. So, to make sure I understand the question. So, so like for example, in the case of commutativity, I mean, there's ways of like customizing the test filter so that it limits the range of what's being tested so that only only like the variables that satisfy certain conditions make it into the test so that like those cases of like say you know division by zero or x being equal to y 
are excluded from the test. And so that the non-commutativity runs on those scenarios where we know it should hold. So we could have like exclude those scenarios where we know it wouldn't hold. Was that your question or did I misunderstand? No, so so um I guess I guess my question would be like, let's say here's a variation on, on something. Like let's say that I have a, a test for the greatest common a, a simple test would be something like uh, look for the greatest common denominator of two numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Euclidean algorithm. And I might say the invariant for this test is, if I'm coming at it from a completely naive point of view, um, if I, I might want to say that at least for some pairs of numbers, this value is greater than one, right? Right. Because for for many pairs of numbers, if I took a, a whole slew of random numbers and they weren't like really well chosen, I would probably get a lot of ones as the right as, right. The, as the greatest common denominator. So is there is there a I, I just I, I'm not I, I've used I think I've I've played around with FS check a long time ago. I was just curious if there's a if there's a use case for for that where you're you're saying like there exists at least some pair of number. I don't know if it would work well in a unit testing scenario, but I, I just I don't know. I'm just kind of curious if that's another thing that one might consider or is useful. Okay, there might have been. I I need to check the documentation, but what you're saying rings a bell. There might have been some some kind of test that may have allowed this. Don't quote me on that, but I can. I can dig around and see, but that's actually ringing a little bit of a bell. Um, but I mean, in general, for something like property-based testing, you probably want to try to hold more towards like the for all case rather than there exists. But 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 no, I, I definitely I definitely see I definitely see what you're saying. The big the, the big danger with the, the there exists case, of course, is that if your random uh, sequence of numbers just legitimately doesn't produce that case, even though it does actually exist. Then that's kind of a problem. See, the, you see, kind of like the the danger in testing that way. Yeah, or or you could just I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you could say like run until it fails. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that might be dangerous too. Um, but yeah, I definitely no, but I definitely, I definitely I definitely see I definitely see what you're saying. Yeah, it's it, it's gonna be one of those things that would be a bit harder to pull off just because you know if it's like one case that exists among say. A range of say billions, then that could be one of those uh, one of those situations. It's almost like it works out better if you have like say more of a symbolic checker that can actually this is implied in a code, and it's almost like something that seems to be a little bit more suited for maybe a theorem prover. Yeah, um, uh, I, you're probably right. I'm just curious. I, I wasn't sure if there's. I couldn't think of a good use case except for the the GCD um, calculation, but. Aren't you able to derive the test cases out of the intermediate steps of the GCD algorithm and get a head start ah. and sort of sneak up on it, like okay. read it, partial yeah. GCD results and see if it notices? And, and yeah, and, and in fact, FS Check does give you the ability to customize your data generation. So, you know, so if you do like, um, do decide to go that route, you do have the support to actually try to generate maybe your data is related in certain ways. Maybe even you generate you know, a large enough set of data, but if they're related in certain ways, you make it much more probable. Yeah, that could be that could be a way. Well, but, but I, I guess what I, what I think about now is, is the definition of what constitutes a property. And if it, if it constitutes a property, then it should be something that you can model. Like, not just like waiting for for it to emerge randomly. Right, or... right. And that's a danger with any kind of for exists, right? I mean, like for all, you you pretty much you know can at least be relied on for that run for. I there guess exists. that's the question. Is, right. is when you say property, do you mean for all? I guess that's that's the question. And that's generally what the property is sort of uh, the property is, is yeah kind of kind of behind the scenes is essentially like a for all. You're kind of looking at for all. And again, there might be ways of doing something like this because. What you're talking about, Chris, I do remember, and maybe I'm just remembered wrong, but in documentation, I think I saw something like that, but it does seem to me that in general, it would be kind of, you know, harder and there'd be a lot of like issues around it. Because in general, the property is kind of like this implicit for all. It could be constrained, you know, by certain your conditions, but there's going to be a kind of like this for all, right? Within this range that we're testing. 
yeah so i i guess it's, it seems it's i'm just kind of curious because it, it's whenever i hear like a logical quantifier like for all i wonder if there's like a does <laughs> there exist is there an equivalent there exists but but I, I could definitely see i can see the i can see what you're saying i mean i, I agree that it you sort of run into halting problem territory uh I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, and you, and you can play around with like, you know, negating, you know, negating the existence to where it's like a, you know, a not in the for all. But again, you know, you're kind of still running into like, what, you know, when would you hit that kind of scenario, right? Isn't that a manipulation logic? Something yeah. that turns for alls into their existence. You should have really negated because it's longer scary. Yeah, because like, well, what is it that when you say there exists X? Aren't, aren't, aren't you saying like that it's not true that for all x yeah. not x holds right so you can basically yeah, do yeah. Morgan. yeah it's essentially the Morgan. Morgan. so in theory you could do that in this kind of but again you still kind of run into the same question of when are you going to hit that and that's kind of like you know that same sort of concern but you could do the logical manipulation yeah that's kind of what i was talking about with like negating it yeah but the whole idea of property-based testing is picking the test cases smartly and so you're not doing it, trying to cover the entire range. You're, and you're not depending on randomly hitting something, but right. just cutting out whole swaths of the input range and testing the important parts from properties you know. Which is why the for all is important, right? Because at least you know, you're, you're going to be testing on everything rather than hoping a particular condition comes yeah. up right away, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, generally speaking, we don't we do want to lean more towards for all lines test. Yeah. Huh. That's a really good question, Chris. Thank you. And I'll and I'll check and see later afterwards because again, this this is triggering something I thought I read somewhere. So I'll let you know if I uh, come up with anything. Because thanks. No, I really appreciate it. it. It's a good conversation for sure. Oh yeah, no, no, I'm digging this. I really like I really like the um, back and forth. This is awesome. So you're doing kind of like a simple examples but does property-based testing come into its own really in like system-wide things where you have this you know 27 so, so things wanna, this thing I, could be i want to interrupt you because i think that's yeah. a super important question but i also want to let him um, get through his slide <laughs> yeah. oh, but because I, and i i've been I, i've been interrupting too so it's, it's I, really I really don't mind the interruption so, i like i like this but, but I do want you okay. to sort of be able to finish what you're okay. saying. And then in particular, that's okay. a super important question. Yeah. yeah. But, but OK. But short answer, we're going to get to a meteor example I used in, uh, in, in actual test case. Yeah. yeah. These short examples are there to kind of illustrate these features. And I'll get into like a, a meteor case study I, I used in a market research context. So, so this is, so we're asking about, can we see the types of values or the values that are actually generated? So when you call check verbose, you actually can, you know, it'll actually generate or rather list all of the data that it generated. So you see here the index number of the data colon and then a data generated. In this case, it's generating just, you know, I only, only needed to generate one data point because it's checking identity. And from and I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, view this as a scrollable element so we can see everything. So over here, you can see that it's a very narrow range of numbers, right? It's not going anywhere near. The range of integers, right? Like what? We never go higher than what is it? Higher than ninety? Um, no, that'd be hundred. Yeah, it's uh, ten that minus seventy minus eighty four, right? So we're in a pretty narrow range. Here. And again, we, we could change the endpoint, but by default, you know, this is this isn't going anywhere near like you know all you know all the integers. And I mean, we could run a few more runs, but of course, you know, the chances of you not hitting the larger number <laughs> in this run is pretty small. So this is pretty you know. Pretty good bits. You can see from the verbose that, yeah, you've got very small. You know, ninety nine is apparently the highest that was generated in this pass. Oh wait, do I actually see a hundred? Do we actually get break a hundred? But you get the idea, right? We're definitely not getting high ranges of numbers here. So it, it's assuming pure functions. It's so. Be, yeah, between I mean it's it's not necessarily gonna it's not gonna choke. It's not running zero function. multiple times. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and because and because you know, try to phrase a property of you know, you know, some some universal property where the property changes after you run it, right? Kind of why the reason why we do functional programming, right? Right. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
It came from Haskell. Of course, it is. <laughs> yeah, based on fair check. But, but, but in, in that case, because what, what I'm saying is, is it, it's the old adage you've got zero, one, and many. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so it should just do zero, one, and two and be done with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, like, like, why is it going to run 100 times? We're going to do zero, one, and two. <laughs> every time because computers are bad <laughs> but yeah so so this gives you an idea of like the narrowness of the range okay and again you're asking about like customize it a number of test ones yeah we can go ahead and call check one and again just update you know modify the config object and tell it that the max test is a thousand which means hey instead of running a hundred tests run me a thousand again it takes a moment to run again it could be just from the polyglot notebook i imagine it's faster one run actually like in Visual Studio or just directly with medline.net. But watch as the thrilling spinner spins. And there we go, right? So it tells us, hey, it, it passed a thousand tests, right? So again, you can customize your test routes here. Now, we're talking about how the data was generated in a very narrow range, right? So I can tell it, hey, give me a higher endpoint with end size. And that pretty much also changes like the distribution, right? So, you know, I, you know, I can run this and basically it's gonna go ahead and you know, and run all of this. But in reality, it does give us like a, a wider distribution. And later on, I have an example where I go through verbose with this. But basically once you do this, it gives you a broader distribution, but again, good luck on hidden zero. Now, instead of say randomizing between say 100 and minus 100, over 100 runs where you got a pretty big chance of pairs being equal to zero, you're going up to say, what is that, 100,000? What are the odds you're going to say hit zero or pairs in this particular? So that's kind of like the also another, another thing that just applies. Right. Because again, we tested this on non commutative, right? Remember, non commutative fails but when we run it on an end size it passed this is the same bad property but it passed here and it passed here again because the end size was so broad it wasn't hitting those problematic values you see what's going on here yeah so that kind of gives you an idea of like why it kind of makes sense that you know within this narrow range you're going to be hitting some of these problematic data points more than likely but definitely use again your understanding of the domain to decide if you know, you could adjust further and what the patterns are likely are. Okay. So filtering data, right? And this is kind of into what Brian was talking about, right? So Brian was kind of asking about, well, you know, what about if we want to kind of like have, you know, tell it to like, you know, run, but avoid certain, certain, you know, certain types of data, right? So for example, commutativity, right? We know, we know again that, you know, Cumulativity fails in some cases. So what I could do is I could say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and run this with a filter. And here I have this operator, which basically lets me put in a predicate here. And if this predicate passes, it goes ahead and goes onto the test, which I wrap in a lazy. Now we do it this way because when we run it this way and a property-based test, test runs it, if the predicate fails, it, gener you know, it generates another one, but it doesn't up the count. So if it generates say, 100 values, 50 of them fail, it'll generate 150 values to get you to 100, right? That's why we're not putting any kind of predicate, say, in a body where it'll be like, oh, hey, if these two are equal, just pass it, because then a lot of your test runs, you know, will be like, okay, they may be bad runs. And you'll see exactly what this means when we start kind of like getting into some details. So in this case, I'm like, hey, so here's my filter. I'm going to pass in a filter, I'm parameterizing it. And if the filter passes, we're going to run this, which is my non commutativity. And so here we know that the division by zero is a problem, right? So my filter right here is, okay, make sure that the denominator is not equal to zero. So I'm like, hey, okay, check quick. Here's my non commutative filter. And my filter is that the denominator is not equal to zero and go ahead and run this on a division. So now I know that it'll generate a hundred test results or a hundred um, samples. And it's going to guarantee that Y is not zero in any of those hundreds. If any of the hundred comes up with Y zero, it generates another one that doesn't, and it doesn't up the count. And so here we run it. And of course, we already know that we're going to fail because we've got other scenarios, right? Minus two and two, of course, X minus X, it's going to, you know, it's going to be commutative. And when we shrink zero and one, 
Because again, since we are testing, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's like, okay, well, I need a meteor filter, right? So I'm like, okay, well, let me go ahead and make sure that X is not zero and Y is not zero. Because again, commutativity, X will be in a numerator at one point, denominator at another. Okay, cool. And then we run it. And here now, again, division by zero is no longer an issue because we filter those out. But of course, we have this case of two and minus two and two and two, right? And we see why. Okay, so I can see here, of course, you know, X should not be equal to Y. Okay, cool. That caught that case, but of course we have minus three and three. Let's make our filter nice and just make sure the absolute values are not equal. That way we catch one the negative, one is a negative of the other. And now we run it and finally, right? Yeah, yeah, shift it, right? Right. And of course, if there's a problem with the function itself, it's time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So sorry, I, I, I got a little bit lost. Um, so uh, the first argument is the filter, and the second argument is the the function on your test. Function your testing. Yeah. I'm just making sure. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I, I just, yeah. I supplied the filter as a, as a lambda. I could have just had it actually separately, which probably would made it a little bit easier to read. So sorry about that. No, 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 no. I'm used to lots of parentheses. Okay. Here, just a lot. In, oh, you used to R. You used to crap the code. You used to R. Come on. Oh, I'm not used to it. <laughs> but yeah. And there aren't nearly enough parentheses in R. That is true. That is so true. So yeah. Um, and also, so that's, so that's our filter, right? Now I can also run this verbose so I can see what it's generating, right? So again, I'm running the same thing with the same filter, but this time I want to see what's all the data that's being run, right? And so, and so this one, and I'm going to go ahead and so you see here, okay, minus two, one, cool, minus three, two, looking good, and so on, right? Now I want to get down to and let me go ahead and uh, turn this scroll bar. Yes. Sorry, I, I know what I got confused on. The non-commutative with filter, I think I missed when you define that function. Oh, oh so, sure. So yeah, it takes sure. two parameters. Yes. So there, mm -hmm. I am just trying to understand. Sure. That. Yeah. So non-commutative with filter takes three parameters, with right? Filter. It takes the filter. That's what I lost. Right. It takes the filter function. It takes the function under test. And it also takes the two values to be fed into the function. And since it's current, right, I don't have to worry about providing those two values. If I don't, the property based testing framework will provide Quick the random values for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Quick curve. check. Uh, yeah. Sure. That yeah. Function. Okay. Right. So, yeah. Right. And then over here again, we see that, you know, we're, you know, it's going over here and we can see that, you know, what, what is it generating? And we can see like all of the data points that it's generating, right? And so over here, we see now take a look at here. This, so this is important. So we see here at, Item nine, at the ninth data point, it generated a zero and a minus four. Remember, none of them should be zero, right? So it, it, this fails the filter, so it generates another value, and the next run is still nine, because it's like, oh, it didn't pass the filter. Let me generate another value, but it's gonna be the same index. That way it's generating 100 data points. That's why you don't like wanna put in a filter inside the body of your function, because it could be like, oh, well, just don't do it if it's this. Well, okay, fine, but maybe out of your 100 tests, only 50 run. This way it's always gonna run. Now, of course, if your filter is super tight and your range is narrow, it might tell you, hey, I can't run enough tests. So you kind of want to be careful. But you can see here that that's exactly what it's doing. It generated another one for zero minus four and it didn't take the test number. It's like, okay, 11 minus eight. Okay, now this is good. Then it took the test number, right? Oh, nine and minus nine. Well, we're not supposed to run that, right? So it didn't tick up 10. We're still on past 10. Okay, minus six, 10. Okay, that's valid. Now it goes to 11. And in this way, so it, so it attempts to run more than 100, but uh, until it gets 100 tests, then it can actually run through our filters and pass. So does that kind of answer your question, Brian, in terms of how you could filter these values beforehand? Yeah. Okay. Cool. okay. And again, if your filter is really strict, that's when you may want to start thinking about expanding your endpoint, right? Because then it may not just have enough data to really do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so we've 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 uh, so we've made it with some pretty weak invariants, right? But they've actually caught a surprising number of issues, or at least things we're assuming about our code, right? Technically, division ain't broken, right? We're just making assumptions. Um, but maybe these are cases where we can make our code more robust. Maybe someone is calling this, and they're not even thinking of division by zero. Which I mean, yes, we'd like to think they should, but who knows? Maybe we can make it more robust. But this has shown us at least scenarios where 
are we happy with our headland division by zero? We want to throw an exception. We want to maybe, you know, you know, have like say like something like a maybe object where we tag, you know, where we tag it. At least this reveals cases of how we want, you know, how we want our interface. And again, we can have like, you know, we can have like, you know, stronger, you know, we can have, you know, stronger, stronger invariants, right? For example, you know, when you when you divide two numbers, right, you get back a Q and R tuple, right? Quotient remainder, and it satisfies this, this equation, right? Quotient times y plus r equals x. And it's pretty, it's it's almost a spec, but there are a few cases where you could fake it out by passing in stuff like you know, zero x. But still, it gives you a pretty a much tighter invariant. So we can have a more involved invariant like this and basically say, okay, well, let's see if this one holds, right? My quotient and remainder. Quotient times our denominator plus the remainder should be equal to whatever numerator was, right? But again, it's also something that's easily faked, right? If I were to create a create a division and just simply return zero x, like in this case, you know, it'll, it'll it'll pass it too, right? But here's the nice thing is that again, if I throw in a weak invariant after weak invariant, we can catch it. I'm like, okay, this seems to work. Well, let me throw the identity at it. And I then immediately flushes out, oh, no, 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 this isn't good. So again, even a sequence of weak invariants or maybe a strong invariant and throwing in a weak one could catch in some issues. So you've got a choice of making your invariant more involved, which is fine, or have a succession of weak invariants that collectively narrow in on the range of what it is you're trying to do. And of course, we can just tighten our spec. We're like, okay, well, you know, here we are, this should hold and also, you know, you know, R, you know, R has to be an absolute value of R has to be less than an absolute value of Y to avoid the cases where we get faked out. So again, we can make our spec much more involved. I mean, we can have a very a crazy, a crazy um, invariant, which is fine because maybe we run into an invariant that's actually total correctness. And we actually have an invariant that tells us, yes, this is division. The invariant now defines division. That's kind of like the holy grail. If you find it, awesome. then you actually, then you actually are getting depth and breadth. But you can't always get this way. And again, with this tighter one, we try it and we see that we can't fake it with our simple fake division because now that we've got this and we also are putting the constraints on R and how it must relate to Y, it's gonna catch out that, you know, yeah, this guy, we can't fake it out, right? This fake division fits. Okay. And again, maybe we could be even a little bit more precise about constraining R and this constraints R, but is this a sufficient constraint? You decide. Okay. Well, invariants always have to be anded, be able to be anded together, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, because because yeah, because if, if any invariant, because if you're if you're putting invariants with ors, you're basically assuming one of them is going to fail when they shouldn't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So okay. this makes for a messy equation. I mean, it, it definitely yeah, the equations can get ugly, but it, they also get involved. But that's also the thing with property based testing is you can get some. Well, really you can good test terms. one after the other. After right, the other, and that's fine too. Exactly. But I, I was just yeah. No, but no, but, but, no, yeah. but no, but it is it is a valid trade off because at this point it's like, hey, do I go for the really hairy, ugly invariant that actually gets me total correctness, but maybe it's so hairy that I make an error in it, or do I go for the weaker invariants that? Don't give me total correctness, but we were good enough and they're easy but enough if you're to understand. Each of them are fine. It's the same. Um, if, I mean, if, if, if all of your if all of your simple invariants collectively amount to that complex invariant, yes. yes. Yeah. Cool. So so you're asking a question about how is this with larger systems, right? Now I don't know if this really qualifies larger system, but this was actually something I did in a prior role. It was at a market research firm. And again, the details. Again, proprietary stuff, all, all sorts of stuff, some stuff's anonymized, but it's, but it's kind of like a high level of what I did to kind of show you where property-based testing came in. So, so basically the firm I was at- And, and you were using F-sharp in general at this point? So in this case, I actually used an ad hoc, an ad hoc one. Basically, I actually like manually wrote in like the property-based testing mm -hmm. in, inside, inside my testing suite, right. Yeah, at that time, we wouldn't have used it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, what, 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 well, that's a nice thing, too, is because once you understand the mindset of property-based testing, you realize that if you wanted to, you know, sure, you're not going to get things like shrinking or whatever, but you could, like, basically write a loop into your test, randomly generate data, and there's a search on those there. And, and nowadays, when I do property-based tests, it's kind of on an ad hoc basis when I realize, hey, I can test this. It's a very useful property. Let me throw this in for a certain number of runs in my unit test. And that's kind of how, that's how I use property-based testing. But yeah, so then this time it was, it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely very much like, hey, let's just manually um, do it, right? Because at the time, yeah, because at the time I was looking at, um, you know, we had like some survey data, 
right? And essentially, we had this mark, we had this data visualization application, and people could pretty much like choose, like, hey, I want to know how many people say in Houston, you know, who are like, you know, those age 18 plus ate fast food in the past week, or how many people, you know, plan to buy a car and also have an income of say 100K plus, right? And so you can ask like all these different questions, and it will give you these number, you know, these values back. And yeah, we had the usual unit test, but also wanted to start testing the behavior of this under some real data. So that was what it's supposed to do. Yes. The year was to verify it really did that if you asked those questions. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so and so and so even though there were, there were like unit unit tests that would do that, I wanted to also check like with some actual like live data. I'm like, well, I want to test with some actual data where I'm not basically concocting some contrived examples. So all of the data is actually atomized or is it bin like you're saying? So do you do you yeah. know about that person? They're in the zero to fifty K range, or you know their exact income, and then you you bin it every time you ask these questions. So in our case. What we had is we actually had the actual, actual like basically the micro data or respondent level data. So we had like every person, we knew all of their habits, we knew the weights, we knew how to weight them. And so we'd have like, a, a, like the data would be based on say 1400, for example, people in Houston, okay? And of course their identities are protected, but 1400 people in Houston, they have these weights. And so we would project them onto the Houston population, but you would actually know like, yeah, for this one person, I know all of their habits because this would all be, even though we got the numbers here, these are the weighted numbers, we had the micro data representing each individual person. Yeah. Well, what I'm asking, I mean, in this case, it doesn't really matter, I guess, but but if you have zero to 50K as one property or 50 to 100K as another property, mm -hmm. then you'd want to do it 49, 999 and 50 and a $1 and make sure it's working, that you're not off by one. I mean, right. In our, a big deal in fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, so in, in our in our case, we call it zero to fifty k, but in reality, it was like zero to forty nine point nine 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 k, and then fifty k. So these so these brackets were actually actually kind of like you know yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah, but I was, I was kind of wrote it this way just because I thought it would look a little bit more pleasant to have zero to fifty k rather than zero. But you're absolutely right because zero to fifty k and fifty to one hundred k. Well. Did you, did you just double somebody at the end points? Well, yeah. I mean, it depends on what you're doing at the boundary. Right. And if that's a huge problem. Well, no, but that, that raises the question. So, so I'm not clear on if your question is just because the, the brackets here aren't listed as mutually exclusive, or if the, the question is, oh, was no. your ch no. checking system actually checking right at the boundary? Because that is super, super important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was my so my check-in system, so my check-in system was not checking at the boundary. The, the, the brackets were mutually exclusive and it was this mutual exclusivity of the brackets that factored into the property-based test that I actually wrote for this. Right. I know, and again, yeah, so well, so for yeah. example, if this was like applying for scholarships and, you, and there was a hard cutoff at a certain income mm -hmm. where the law says, no or yes, you know, it's critical that you're not off by one or right, right. Yeah, and test that one. Yeah. yeah. But in our case, yeah, this was yeah, but this was definitely very much zero to 49999.99 K. And then it was 50 to 100 K. So but the endpoints again were just kind of made to look more clean. But yeah, absolutely. It was not, it was not duplicated. Yeah, internally it was no, not it yeah. Oh no, 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 but no, but that's but that's a valid question because the way I'm presenting it. It definitely looks like it. it definitely we're asking like it about the, the 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 actual how it was implemented, but let, let's 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 ask you about about that at sure. the end and sure. go on because that corresponds with the question that I that I do have. Is that the again, actual data? No, no. This this is okay. No. So like there are only a thousand people, fifty or hundred k. Oh yeah, no. This is bunk data. Thousands. Yeah. <laughs> Those are rich people in a lot. Yeah, no, this, no, this, yeah. So this, this, yeah, this, um, yeah. So there's, there's a technical term for this data, and it, and it's and it's called manufactured. But uh, yeah, because because their actual data is obviously something I don't want to reveal for obvious reasons. But yeah, obviously the numbers will be hard. I mean, I, I would really hope there's more hundred thousand people saying this thing, right? But yeah, so yeah. Um, this is totally manufactured data, just to give you an example of the kinds of stuff we're looking at. I mean, even, even like the tests themselves, I just have stub functions just to really show you the structure of the tests. So, yeah. 
but yeah, but within, within so you have these one different demographics. Hmm? Yeah. Each bucket has that after 100,000. And that's the test. There you go. That was a property test because it's like, hey, I want to test this. I want to test this, not worrying about the data. I want to be able to actually have this live data coming in. I need to know what universal property holds. The demographics, every bracket, which is mutually exclusive, has to add up to the total. So no matter what, and the habit could be like any kind of composition of factors. It could be like eight fast food and plan to buy and yeah, right? This is like a pivot table then too or something. Yeah. Essentially something, something very similar to it. Yeah, one a little bit more than that. Yeah. Adding up for it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, so, so the whole idea was like, okay. So it's a test of the structure of the data. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the testing, yeah, so the testing was basically like, okay, so and again, this is just some like dummy code that just kind of shows you what the structure of the test was, right? You have your market, you've got some habits, right? You got the different demographics. Here I just got a randomized demo sum that just basically returns an incorrect value 10% of the time, just so we have a fun failure to look at, right? We've got the total adults, which you know basically I just have it just locked in. But essentially, I was all I was testing was like, hey, the demographics of any given like market. The demographic and the habit, right? When we sum up all of them, they have to be equal to the total of those. And that was really what 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 that test was, right? And so I would randomly pick a market, or if we actually released a new market, I would say, okay, we're going to work on this market, but I'm going to randomly pick some set of say some set of um demographics, or even some set of targets. We call them targets, right? Like a fast food, whatever. Test them across all demographics and run a property based test. Okay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to channel the, the developer who we developed who, who yelled at me about my unit tests uh -huh. in the 90s. When could that fail? When, when could it fail because of data errors? So basically, what happened was when we ran this, the code was fine, but because I was running on live data, it actually found when data was getting corrupted. It was so successful yeah, at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became part of our data validation process. <laughs> so this was something I was basically written to like check it. It was like, hey, wait, what's going on? Oh, wait a minute, this data spell, this data spell. They're like, how are you figuring that? I'm like, well, I got this. Like, hey, guess what? This is part of our validation pipeline. So you think it bends when it comes into your system already? Well, well if what, you get an individual data item with all the features, then well, what would it end up? Well, we well, we have we have some process in, in house. So in addition to getting all the data, there's some in house process. Up. Right, somebody might have coded something wrong. Maybe there was something where you know some you know some corruption you know happened. Something got truncated. Someone threw in minus. There are cases where some corruption could happen here and there. Yeah, because there was some. There's a fair amount of in-house processing of that data. So the DBA hated you for finding out their mistake. Yeah. Um, Mine did. They, I mean, they, 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 they never. I mean, I, I didn't have like a bunch of them waiting for me with like pitchforks and you know and torches or anything. But um, client, um, clients were pretty happy because they at least didn't get that data right. We caught that pretty, yeah. The DBA didn't come to you to ask you to write their validations and, or the triggers or whatever? No, they, um, well, I, I worked very closely for them. And the ones we actually had like doing this, they weren't real quite DBAs. They were more like, well, they call them programmers, but they weren't programmers. They're kind of programmers in a survey sense, but they're essentially like we played the role of the DBAs. Um, but essentially, but essentially, I mean, I've used this to run the validations for them, but I also wrote other validations for them because we worked actually very closely. They were, they definitely were, were very, um, aligned on yeah this made a lot of a lot less work for all of us in the long run so yeah so this was so this so this was a scenario where basically in this case the property was you know I wasn't looking at any of the stock invariants but just insight into what the structure of the data was that implied the property and we ran it and also became a data validation tool which you know was a very you know an unexpected win and of course it turned out that the code was fine too so now and I mean, I could have went further with this. I mean, at the time, at the, you know, because at the time, you know, I really here I just kind of put in like one filter or maybe just a handful of filters, like three or four filters and them. But in reality, we actually like you could you could combine your fil your different like demographics, like say, oh, you know, uh, you know, bought you know, gonna buy fast food and gonna buy a car or gonna take a vacation and right, you could you know. So in reality, you know, could have went further and just been like, well, why not just go ahead and just you know randomize on that too so I mean, if i wanted to you know we could have just went ahead and just like you know created you know basically basically use you know f sharps type system algebraic data types to produce you know to go ahead and just you know define you know, our little boolean our little boolean logic system for combining all of our demographics right or rather our targets 
And then of course, now that we have this, and because it's a type, quick check and generate random Boolean expression, uh, expression languages for us. So if I were to run this, right, we can see here that, you know, I'm like, okay, it generated this random, okay, well, if I or and and, you know, the filter of exercise past week in this with exercise past week, you know, then this basically should pass. And the nice thing about this too is one, of course, it now lets me check, now lets me test our own internal Boolean mechanisms where basically, they're more like, they're more like set theoretical, that's what I'm calling them Boolean, where we're basically making sure we're combining all of our targets correctly, right? So that's another nice little test that we, that we would had if, if I had done it this way. Also, it gives us another idea for a test because now as I, as I run this, I realize, hey, another property we could do is, you know, you know, I could do like say, you know, not, you know, like here, right? For example, well, not, not of some filter should be equal to that filter. So I could also have had another, and just kind of looking at some of the random, random expressions it would generate this way. I could have basically just go, went ahead and used that as another property and tested that. This is actually kind of going further than, than, than I did because the system wasn't a sophisticated FS check, but the fact that again, it could generate, you know, trees of arbitrary types, sure. That one's trying not not a filter back to not filter. Right, so, it, right. Well, didn't this, notice yeah. an error with just not filter, or just got lucky that time, didn't notice. Oh, well, then, well, in this case, my error, I have my error just basically being randomly generated just so I can have it just spit out errors. Shrinking, it's a random. Yeah, because like, it's shrinking and it's so random. shrinking gets rid of Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this shrink is like shrink, shrink, it's passing shrink. Oh, it failed. It doesn't know that I'm basically telling it failed 10% of the time. <laughs> so, of course, shrink doesn't realize what's going on. Yeah. The shrink needs a beer. The shrink needs a beer and a better client. Yes. So, um, but yeah, but essentially, but essentially, you know, once you have that, then you, then you can actually start checking, you know, the structure of your filters themselves. And that can be independent. Oh, so, your data. so, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out now. This, this is this is where I was hoping you would go and expecting that you would go. And and booleans are easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think about more, even more complex structures where instead of booleans, you have lists or strings or. Mm -hmm. And my inclination is, yeah, that's all going to work. <laughs> but but I'm just trying to figure out, like, are there places where this is going to fail? So it can. So I mean, can, can I yeah. write a quick check for that? <laughs> like like yeah. when quick check fails. So um, it'll, yeah. So it'll, I mean, so it'll definitely generate like you know lists and strings and so and on. And random strings and yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, empty string. It would get. I would like to get an empty string. Probably strings with a few characters, maybe some funky characters. But, but there's also actually more involved custom data generation where if you're concerned or you know roughly the kinds of data at least it should generate, you could nudge it. Because like over here for, yeah. In fact, like over like this example is a little bit hairier, but this one actually shows you that you can actually do more custom data generation. Like, like, like so far I've pretty much been leaning on just a type system to give me the structure that I need and maybe a filter beforehand to filter out items. But you can actually, guide it and tell it, hey, look, I need you to generate data where this is related to this and this is, you know, and this has, you know, this particular constraint value and so on. And it does get, it does, it's, it's definitely like not as clean looking, but this is like the most powerful point where you're basically even telling it, hey, generate like a couple of integers, you know, go ahead and filter, you know, give me, you know, give me this demographic and habit and this has to be, you know, in this set and satisfy this, et cetera, et cetera. And then you run like a prop for all, and you generate a filter and you run your property and basically you run it. So again, there's details on the side in FS check, but it definitely gets a little bit, it definitely gets a little bit more, but this does give you like that ability. Because the moment you start getting into strings and stuff like that, you might want to have strings that even though they're random, maybe you want them to look like an email address, right? And I'm not sure if they have like email, like email address yeah. generators, or that's something you want to generate, but yeah. And this is where you pretty much, that's where you kind of go into like, you know, this is like, you know, you know, advanced mode, we're kind of like, okay, well, I need to start generating my property now and, you know, let's get into that. And you can see here, it starts generating the tuples, the numbers are constrained to fall in certain ranges. The strings are also constrained. See here, it's actually, it's actually generating, it's actually picking a string randomly from a list, but it's guaranteeing that it's coming from this list. And so you can see here that it does at least constrain the string. Is there an equivalent of this for dynamically typed languages? Yes. I mean, like JavaScript has one, uh, Racket has one, Closure, 
I think closure's close your spec, yeah. Close your spec, yeah, I think does it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. because yeah. yeah, like that that I'm having a hard time understanding because yeah. I can easily, not easily, but I can I can understand statically typed, right? But dynamically typed seems with much more complicated. Oh yeah, because in the dynamic type, because in the dynamic languages, you don't have the static types to rely on. Like the fact, the fact is, like for example, here, right here, like this example, it's able to generate these arbitrarily complex expressions because it's got the type. It uses a type right. system. It knows. In those other languages, like if you're doing this in say Racket or JavaScript, you have to provide your generator because it doesn't know. It's like you well, have to provide the generator. That's okay. where yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Okay. But but it's easier in uh, in dynamic languages um, because he's using discriminated unions, right? Yeah. But you can use um, um, record types in F sharp, and F sharp does not do reference comparison, so it actually goes to the values to determine if one record is equal to the other. Right. So you can you can run a process where you know if you run the driver test, then the, the output needs to have a property that is, you know, the score or whatever. And, and so you start like running tests on the properties of your record types instead of, you know, the, the just simple example that you see here as a number. Mm -hmm. And then you start to realize things by your that, like this thing needs to have this property because, and it's very easy, I, I'm not sure about the closure or whatever you say, but, but in Ruby, you can say like, you can ask if an object has a property. It's very easy, and so mm -hmm. the, the idea is that you you run you run your your um, property based testing, and then you check the properties of your result. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And pretty much every language I looked at, I've seen at least one property based testing framework. I mean, Python's got it. It's it's but not. yeah, it's yeah. So it's but again, it's like yeah, the capabilities are gonna. Are going to vary based on, like, for example, a type system and just how much of a lift they can get from that. But yeah, but that's a really good point. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah, and um, and that pretty much um, yeah, and again, so we already kind of know the summary, right? We're pretty much near, near the end of the talk, so we got a large number of test cases with property based testing, unbiased test input kind of helps flush out our assumptions, right? Um, or even blind spots. You know, we could sometimes have test input that reveals edge cases we could go ahead and feed into example-based tests, right? Sometimes complete specs. Again, it's really the mindset of how we think about our code now, right? We're looking in terms of like invariance, what set of invariance defines or narrows in our code, narrows in the behavior of our code. And again, you know, in my case, this was a plus, right? The ability to even test on anything, including like live data, right? And if you don't even end-to-end -end test, I've done actually property-based end-to-end testing where, you know, there are a few cases where you know, I was looking at like what was fed into say an input box and I was able to do it even when we were connected to the server. Um, but of course, writing tests can be harder. You get breadth, but you don't get depth unless you find a complete property if you're lucky enough. Um, and again, some of the frameworks aren't as easy to use, right? They're not every framework is very straightforward, right? And then here I just kind of a further reading section, which again, I could just paste all of these in the chat or even email them to you if anyone's interested. You know, documentation and FS check specifically as a learning resources. This is like kind of where I got the properties to list from, what the useful properties to test. But they go into more detail on what these are. I mean, the guy goes into, into some good detail. And again, of course, Haskell's quick check, right? The grandparent of them all. Um, you know, Racket has rack check, closure has test.check for those who are, you know, more into scheme. There's a whole book of property based tests in the Elixir. It's sad. I really couldn't find any, a lot of books on like property based tests, only Elixir. I think I can find another one, which is not like for R. <laughs> Shockingly, <laughs> no. So, you know, because, but yeah. Um, okay. Is probably yeah. a library? Yeah. I mean, right so you look for the R huge implementation. implementation. <laughs> I, I know, I have not looked for the R implementation. Yeah. I, I can. Yeah. And anyway, anyone's interested, I could I could paste any of these links for them or, no, or send email it to me. And, email. Okay. I'll, I'll include it yeah. when I post the video. Cool. Yeah. So I'll I'll email all these to Claude so you all can check them out if you're interested in, in digging further into this. You can have um, the whole yeah. file. I can give you the whole file if you want it. Yeah. Yeah, because this this is basically just a Python notebook. Just install um just install the polyglot notebook in Visual Studio Code. Um and then yeah, just, you're good to go. Just install a bunch of stuff and then you can see the stuff. I have a question sure. that's not really related to how did you like? Did you enjoy working with the polyglot notebook in Visual Studio? <laughs> I, 
I did it a little bit. I, I, I played around with it for a little while, and it didn't really appeal to me. And I'm just curious, and was I missing something? God, no. So, um, so I enjoyed it, but I used notebooks, whether they're Polyglot, Colab, um, Jupiter, always as presentation and 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 learning tools. So, um, like I never actually use them for any real coding. Okay. It's only if I want to do a presentation because I can have live coding, yeah. have changes, share my results. And I love them for that, but I would probably not use them for much of anything else, unless I was writing maybe like a document about something I was exploring that had little bits of code sampled to support what I was writing yeah. about. But really the code is never like the focus in these things for me. Yeah. So yeah, because were you doing it like what was your use case? Like what were you doing? Well, it, it, for this, I was it was an open source project that he wanted to you the, the guy who started it was using a notebook as the review. It, okay. it sounds like an awesome idea. It, it is actually pretty good for the people who are users, but for somebody trying to contribute, it doesn't have to be a giant pain. Yeah, I mean, just a giant pain. Yeah, I mean, anyway, no, I'm not curious about that. No, I'm totally with you. In fact, I used, I used to, I mean, in general, I used to like hate <laughs> Jupiter. And it was only when I started kind of getting into these, these cases where I was like, you know, trying to present, like do a little bit of kind of like my own research. I was focused on that and presented stuff. And I was like, oh, I get it. It's good for this, but it sucks for all those other stuff I was trying to use for. And that's kind of like my view too. Yeah, you, so, you just use the tool for the thing it's intended for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Anytime I'm doing any kind of coding, and even in that scenario, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'd be kind of like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And then if I'm doing anything like say Python or anything like supporting more, like, like say Python, I'd probably even go as far as like just Colab. Like whenever we do our just enough math groups and all coders in Python, it's always Colab to just share the links. That's the thing also with the Polyglot notebooks. Like, yeah, you got to install. It's not rocket science, but still, you have to install, you have to install the extension, you have to make sure that your kernels are set up. And then I think you have to make sure your version of .NET is up to date. Then you can go ahead and use it. And again, it's a little extra work. Whereas Google Colab is like, Click on the link. You know, do you have a Gmail account? I don't know. Almost everyone on the planet does. It's free, great one. You know what I mean? It's like the sharing also is another. Um, but yeah. No, but that's a good question. This is like my first time actually presenting on a polyglot notebook, just because the F sharp support was 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 better. Yeah, um, it, 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 yeah. I mean, I thought it worked pretty well for the presentation. Yeah. 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 All right. I want to thank you. So, uh, some time for uh, questions. I want to start with Lester because I cut you off with a big question, and then everyone can sort of chime in. Um, you covered. You covered. Are, are, are you happy? Are, are these recorded questions or are these? We're on the, we are on the recorded questions. <laughs> Period. They're fun, They're fun questions. How we got fun so, questions. So, and, and then I will tell you when we're cutting off the recording, and then we can do. That's the, when the fun the, starts. Yeah, that's okay. when the fun starts. Okay. Yeah. I, I did have one. Does this fit into a test driven development workflow? So this is a really good question. So I've only toyed, I've only toyed with like using this in a test driven development context. And at least my initial, and this is just absolutely initial impressions are it you could do it but you are going to need to think more deeply than like test-driven development normally does. Because with example-based tests, you know at least what your samples are. Because a lot of times also with test-driven development, I won't say a lot of times, but sometimes you're sometimes even sort of trying to figure out what function you really need. And sometimes you're kind of, you know, so when you're, when you're kind of in a case where you're trying to figure out what are your invariants of a function where you're not even sure what the function is that you quite need, it could be a bit of a task, but at least my initial one, my initial toying with it, because kind of I toyed around a bit with it, is that it looked like it was promising. And one day I do want to try like an actual non-trivial project, just doing test-based, property-based testing, because I'd like to know like from beginning to end how the experience is. But when I at least initially tried, it seemed pretty promising, and I'm interested in, in going further with it. But you definitely have to think a lot more about it. Well, it also isn't really a deterministic testing. Correct, because you're you got different right because they get different. Yeah, you go down and, and then it, suddenly it's not working. And oh my gosh, it may have been broken for a while, and I've been building it. Right, 
because that random sequence I was generating maybe never hit, hit upon that one bad test point. I mean, but on the other hand, if you're doing example-based testing and you pick your test points, maybe you miss some of these errors too, right? Especially if we're kind of writing what we think should be right. Because that's the other thing too about this is that it does force you to be more robust with your functions because now that it's basically throwing all kinds of data, some of which sometimes programmers may not even test for because they assume well, they never do that. It kind of forces like, well, this fails on zero. Well, no one should run it on, well, it fails on zero. What are you going to do about it, right? So it does kind of force you to be more robust. In, in well, how does this relate to like fuzzing? When you're yeah. trying to break something, yeah. is fuzzing going, fuzzing you don't really know what to test. You don't really know the boundaries until you discover them accidentally, at least if you're trying to break into a system. Well, here you, you know all the boundaries to test and you can kind of design it's it doesn't sound box. like it, it, it doesn't box. sound like you're de I mean you could define the boundaries to test, but it doesn't sound like the system itself has any sense of boundaries except that like it, it restricts the range so that it's likely to hit zero. And and that seems people fuzzy goofy are looking for to me for bugs, but they don't it's a black box, so they don't really have the good ideas on where those boundaries are yeah I, I almost think that fuzzy is sort of a subset of this <laughs> in the sense that there are more constraints in fuzzy like typically you don't know yeah anything about how the system I mean you know what it's supposed to be right but you don't know what it's doing you don't know the you don't know the right is, is you know, that correct so you well guess them as time goes on but you learn them yeah, you learn it. Just learning, right? right? Yeah. But a failure is a good sign, right? The whole idea of fuzzing. Yeah. And and my understanding, and this is actually more of at least at least the scenario of fuzzing that I'm familiar with. There could be several different scenarios. Is where folks also will use fuzzing to try to test the test quality. Right. Yeah. So they'll kind of like write. So it's kind of like, hey, did you write a meaningful test or did you throw in some? Let's perturb this and and, and see, you know, if your test is worth it. Right. Um, but it is, but it is definitely kind of like in that in that there is an automated element to randomizing a test that's very similar to what's kind of happening here. Yeah. Yeah. So this question comes from just what I was doing today. But imagine you have a really large range of possible valid values, but it's got giant holes in it. I'll be more specific. Think about how Unicode works. You know how Unicode works, right? Yeah. Nobody knows how Unicode works. <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Just imagine. But in general, right, there's like this, this, there's a, there's one level, like most, almost all the values in the basic multilingual plane are filled in, right? But once you get beyond that, you've got these giant areas where there's like big it's holes in this, right? And, and yeah. So the problem I was thinking about today is like, I'm taking this bag of bodies and I'm turning it into an array of characters. And I, it's been asserted that this is UTF-8, and so it is, you know, I should be able to check whether it handles valid UTF-8. But the problem is, is that how do I generate the appropriate range of values, right, to test whether my side of it works, right? Yeah. And, are, are I, don't, I don't think there's actually a really good answer in property based testing, but my example based testing kind of is that's it, kind of sucks. I mean, the first thing I do is when you do something like, by the way, this is generally good, if I put a poop emoji, a, a character from Linear B syllabary, and then another poop emoji as part of your test. Yeah, no, I'm serious about this. There are strings like that, aren't there? <laughs> testing strings for unit testing. JCJ testing. Aren't there those well, ones with a Turk, a Turkic character? It looks exactly mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know, a regular so character, but it's not. So that's true. That's that's so I'm worried about the bytes, right? Yeah. And so the point of that is in UTF-8, what you get by beyond the, well, the, the basic of the play, right? You have these values that are 
it can be very difficult to deal with if your underlying system is actually using UCS 16. And because I know the framework that I'm using is under the coverage of UCS 16, but still I'm supposed to handle it, right? What I'd like to be able to do is generate a whole bunch of bags of bytes that are actually valid UTF-8. But that's a non-trivial thing Isn't to that do. Just filtering? No. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe in a way it is, but I mean, I mean, okay. if you if you send something that's a valid UTF-8 encoded, it just happens that you give something that doesn't exist as a character yet. If the so system needs a, to say, I don't. Well, well sorry, I don't understand that. Right? Is that well, what you're testing? That it well, will, partly, partly I want to know that if if I get invalid bytes, it will try to interpret them or something. Yeah. In general, I mean, it's a reasonable test to say, pick from this whole set of values, right? Because even if it's not actually, if there's no character assigned there, yeah. it should be able to do something with it, right? The problem is you can't tell. Because when you turn it back in, it's just going to show a question mark for all of us. Like, okay. literally, the rule is if you get an invalid, you know, you, you actually learn what to turn it into. Okay, so so you would like to test one out yeah. of the non-existent, and then all the other things. Well, I, 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 what I'd really like to do is be able to to say, okay, just give me like pick random Unicode value, yeah. whether whether I thought sports or not. I don't know. Yeah. The reason I suggested those characters is that they have really good font support. Believe it or not, really good font support, so I can see the getting the right value. Oh. Right, so there's lots of characters that I know are valid in Unicode, but you have to be very careful about the fonts you use to be able to tell that they're working but visually, right? But part of the problem that you're running into in that case of like, I don't understand it, return a question mark is that it's a total function. Right. right? And you can't test that right. anymore, right? Because exactly. the total function works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And it returns it the like, question mark character. Yeah. Well, it, it, so you if it's really it. valid, it should be converting that into a specific supply. <laughs> not just not just the regular question mark, but it's a it's that's the failure that you always get when it's, you're on the web. Like, like yeah, but I, I I don't know what what's, what's the code behind that. Well, so here's the thing. Is, like, but that also. Is what's supposed to happen if your font doesn't support it. Yeah, if your font doesn't support it, it's supposed to give you the bodies, yeah. but show the other character. But if it's an invalid character, it's supposed to convert the invalid character into a special value that is that that also is represented by the question, which is why visually it becomes very hard to tell what's going on. It, it, it's not really important. I kind of figured out my well, then, uh, Okay, so I guess that, that was this question of maybe. It, that I didn't catch here. When something fails, what is it catching? Is it catching an exception every time? Um, so it's catching, I mean, so it's catching, so it's catching an assertion failure. Does it does it's 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 a boolean? It's just a boolean that it's does catch can be a boolean. It will also catch exceptions too, but exception is thrown that is considered a test failure as well. So it does catch an exception. So it's a boolean or an exception. Yeah. Really? So yeah, because 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 the, the assert and when it, when the assert fails, does assert generate an exception when it fails in a property based testing framework, or rather in any testing framework? I don't think if it does, it should. Yeah. Okay, so it might just be testing and catching exceptions in general. Just exceptions. Yeah. Which which is messed up when you're when the success is an exception. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reminded. I, 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 as a sociologist, I will say. Success is almost always an exception. <laughs> no, this is oh, so. I'm sorry. I, I apologize to everybody, but this is something I have ranted about literally for 25 years. I calculated it up today. <laughs> the first time I remember complaining about this was 1998. Um, <laughs> Thanks for coming. Every message queuing system I've ever used, when you're reading messages out of the queue, and you you have successfully read all the messages, you know what happens next? They throw a freaking exception. It's like that's not a problem, dude. I succeeded. I'm the reader. You finished. Right. I'm done. I can wait for you to do more work. But every single one of them for the last 25 years, 
Throws an exception. It especially the wrapper function. The old wrapper library. Okay, so I, I think we are past yeah, the sorry. time. The I time just came like, in. Or, I, the party just started. No, 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 this, 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 this is the, no, no, this this is the post to just record the questions. So I'm, I'm going to ask if anyone, especially online, has a question that they want to ask to be recorded, pipe up now, or I'm going to stop the recording. And then we're going to have the after party where the interesting yeah. questions. Yeah. I, was, I was just going to ask a quick question. Um, so one of the things that was kind of I noticed was that a lot of the values that tend to um, <clears throat> fail aren't just like you know random values. They're like values that satisfy certain algebraic relations, right? So like they either satisfy some linear relationship um, or some you know uh, polynomial relationship. Uh, so. And this probably has to do with the fact that like most of the time we're worried about like, a lot of the time we're worried about divide by zero errors, right? And divide by zero, you know, tends to happen when a bunch of, um, I guess a bunch of monomials in a denominator equals zero, which is only satisfied when you satisfy a certain polynomial equation. So like, it seems like the best way to do this kind of random testing is to not select evenly, you know, especially when you have like multiple different numbers, is not to select evenly, like a unit from a uniform distribution of numbers, is to like select from um, sort of prefer to select from numbers that are that satisfy low sort of um, small coefficient polynomials. Is there anything that like that does that? So I mean when I say polynomial, I mean like x equals if you're selecting a pair of numbers. You might want to prefer to choose x equals y or x equals negative y, or yes. x plus y plus z equals zero, or something like that. So for this, so for this, I think you'd probably be leaning on. Am I still sharing? Yeah, you still. Yeah. I'm still. Yeah. So I'm thinking you'd probably lean on the custom data generation because at this point, this is where you could pretty much not only like generate like you know, you know. You're, you're generating custom data, but you also have like some of the data that's generated be a function of a previous a data that was previously generated, right? It's just kind of like going through the pipeline and doing that. So I think in a situation like this, this is probably kind of like one of the use cases where you want to, you know, specifically do something like this. That would be that would be my guess. It's like yeah, because 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 at some point, yeah, I mean, and and just more generally speaking, right? Anytime you know there's some kind of relationship among the inputs you want to enforce and you just don't want to do it by way of a filter because maybe it's a little bit more involved or maybe you're going to get so few hits on a filter you're going to run out of uh, run out of tests right and so you want to ensure that by design your data has those relationships whether again you got a polynomial relationship or really any kind of relationship i think you probably are probably going to be using the custom data generation here yeah I, I mean i'm just thinking like from from the point of view of like a random like completely random generation if there's like there's probably some a research problem out there trying to figure out what the best sampling strategy is for for completely random testing. I just feel like there's probably when you're when you're looking at tuples to have, you know, even if you're looking at like a login or something like that, um, it probably makes sense to to test. In my case, uh, first name Chris, last name Chris, right? Because that might fail somewhere in a validation system or to incorrectly um you know design validation system where they say first name can't be the same as last name or something like that um so I, i'm just gonna i'm just kind of curious if there's any prior art on that or if that's something that's uh even a consideration but i mean that's, I, I was just thinking about it, it it's it, there's i think there's like a lot of interesting deep problems in this area so i think it's, it's really cool that you, you gave a talk on it well, thanks. No, I think and I, and I think you got your, your question is really interesting, right? I think a lot of it would depend also on the task, right? Because the distribution that you're using, would, like for example, let's say you're trying to test an application that maybe among its inputs extends, say, a user's weight, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we know that weight generally is going to be in a normal distribution, and we know roughly what the mean of the weight would be, and that sort of thing, right? So we can kind of say, hey, we know what the distribution looks like for that. We want to draw from that distribution when when doing a random testing, right? But then if you're dealing, say, with you know different type of data that can 
think of one on top of my head, there's something to say with like a heavy tail distribution, right? Then you got a different one. So a lot of it's going to be like task specific. So no, I, I definitely I definitely agree with you that there's probably good distributions for tests, but I think they're more domain specific because different domains will just require like different distributions. But it's a really good question because yeah, it, it'll be really cool if uh, there was a way out of the box where you can sort of like specify some stock distributions. Like, you know what? Yeah, do this, but go ahead and just make it a normal distribution with the mean this and standard deviation that. Yeah, that would be yeah. Or, or, or to just like, you know, sample the first 50 from a uniform distribution and the next 50 from a uniform distribution or something, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to think how, yeah, no, that's, and that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, taking the distributions into account really, really neat. That, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's really good. It's really insightful, yeah. Um, but it'd definitely be like domain specific, but it would be cool, you know. Um, and I wonder, and I wonder if maybe like, it would be something where we just write our own custom generators, at least for some stock distributions, and then throw them into this pipeline. Because I'm guessing we could pretty much throw in some of these custom generators, and they just have like these distributions we can just, you know, lean on. But yeah, I just want to kind of speculate on what we could do here. Good job. Thanks. Really nice talk. Very much. Appreciate it. Very, very, um, very good question. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to um, cut off the recording. Um, because we're still recording.